Hi, I'm Wendy Murdoch, and this is Webinars with Wendy. I've been doing a series of webinars with top equine professionals during the pandemic to keep myself entertained, learn something new, and present to you some really fabulous information. Many of my guests are people that kind of live in their own little world and aren't necessarily <laughs> technologically um, savvy. And so they have fabulous information, but it hasn't been getting out to the world. And so I feel that this is really important information. And that's one of the things about today's webinar I'm so excited about. Um, because today we're gonna be talking about the thoracic slime, uh, spine with the folks from Equisoma, Diane Dezingle and Pam Eckelberger, and they have set up this marvelous little studio for us so that we can really get to understand the thoracic spine. So um, my background today, by the way, this is my uh, uh, Joe Pye weed. I'm really excited about this because I get tons of butterflies. And so later on, I'm gonna post a picture when they flower of all the butterflies. And um, this is also on Facebook Live, but please remember I cannot handle any of the comments on Facebook because I'm managing the webinar. Afterward, we'll try and answer your questions on Facebook. And just remember that you can find this in all the webinars on my Surefoot Equine YouTube channel. Um, we're up to, this is number 70 or 71. This is really amazing. Um, so I would love to introduce you to, to Pam and Diane, and I'll let them give you a little bit of brief background before they get going. Take it away, ladies. We have to, we're right. there. Whoa. Yeah, here you go. Okay. okay, we have to give background on us again? Just a tiny bit, because not everybody saw your first one. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm like, okay. Well, I'll ask you a question, like, where did these bones come from anyway? Uh, horses, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, this all started, we're both body workers. Um, okay, I, I got to look at the screen. Um, I'm Pam Messian, and... Uh, we, we're both uh, equine body workers, Diane much more so than myself. Um, I became more interested in initially in uh, finding a skeleton that I could take around to customers, blah, blah, blah. Ended up digging up my own horse, um, Petey. He's the start, he was the start of all of this um, from, that was about three or four, four years ago. And from what I was learning from his skeleton, I got very interested in looking at others. That's when Diane and I hooked up, and Diane dug up a skeleton of her own. Not one of which, which happens to be this skeleton here that I, we're slowly but surely articulating, <laughs> little bits at a time. Um, we're based in Aiken, South Carolina, um, and uh, we ended up getting so many bones and skeletons or partial skeletons that we renovated a, um, a storage shed that I have on our property here and turned it into this lovely osteology and anatomy learning center. Um, so we are primarily uh, research education. Uh, most of the education is for the two of us. <laughs> and then we like to try and pass on what we're learning about our courses to other interested people. So we do uh, invite visitors and we hold, uh, when COVID's not going on, we have small groups that come in, we give lectures. And um, pretty much most of the bones here are pathological <laughs> we don't have too many there, there is nothing nothing's normal, normal. <laughs> we have bones now probably getting close to from 25 horses or so like i say they're not all full skeletons we're working on the articulating one um but the pathologies we're finding are just fascinating and raise more questions than answers for us so and so when the pandemic's over, people could actually come and visit your boat. They could contact you, make an appointment, and come and, and spend some time with all these bones. And um, obviously, you've gotten permission for many of the bones that you have there. Um, it's not like you're well, grave yeah, robbing or anything like that. <laughs> <laughs> grave robbers, Wendy. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to make that clear to, the, to people watching. Um, and the, the stories that bones tell, uh, I mean, I've known from the little bit that I've done with bones is fascinating. And it's, it's um, in a way, it's like forensics, isn't it? Um, that by reading the bones, you can determine things that happened in a horse's life. Um, and so uh, we can learn from that in terms of what to do and what not to do with our own horses to avoid some of the pathologies that you're seeing in these skeletons. Absolutely. And that's, that's the direction that we find ourselves going in now. Um, Yes, we, we, we get uh, permission 
volunteer donations from horse owners. Some of them are uh, anonymous ones, uh, but I've been working with a wonderful person up in Maine who composts horses, National Composting, and she's uh, helped me find people who want to donate the horses that they end up putting down and she composts. So that's where a lot of these are coming from. And it, as that has developed, um, we have gotten, well, last summer we got requests to uh, retrieve the bones of a thoroughbred who was having very bad issues with behavior with his owner, he was only eight years old. It's a long story, the story is on the episoma.com website under Apollo, many people would know the Apollo story. So what the owner asked us to pick up, look at the bones, clean them, look them up and see if we could give her any answers because diagnostics at the vets did just weren't, weren't giving her answers. And we ended up finding some very, very fascinating pathologies that the horse was born with. And from that story, now we have three or four waiting for us up in May for this summer. We've got that one down here that's being composted and all these horses have very similar profiles. The beauty is, is that we, like you say, when we get the history of the horses, we're looking at the pedigree, the breeding, the, the life of the horse, and as much information as we can get from the owners, and that helps us look at the bones and see if we can piece things together. And people can see that first webinar. It's on the Surefoot Equine YouTube channel. Um, I, I don't think I was numbering them at the time, so I can't tell you what number it is, but if you just go to the channel and you just, put in the search box, Equisoma, and it, it'll pop up. Um, it was a, we did look at Apollo and it was a really interesting story. So you can find out more about that there and going to the, it's Equisoma, Equis.soma, right? E -Q -E Equis dash, dash. Equis dash soma .com. Yep, okay, so I put that in the chat. Um, we have a question about somebody wanting uh, you to talk about the cranial vault, but I think we need to leave that to another webinar because we have so much to talk about today. And I know um, that you've prepared this one. So um, let's go ahead and get started and talk about the thoracic spine and I'll make a note about that for a future webinar. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, we would love to cover all kinds of things, but uh, as Wendy said, she has requested that we do an overview of the thoracic spine um, and how elements of the spine and morphology um, work together with the movement in the spine. Um, this is a very, at first we kind of went, oh my gosh, because this is a very, very complex subject, as many of you may know. Um, the biomechanics studies on horses have taken off with amazing studies where they put pins in the horses and computerize and all that. We're not going there. We're going to try and keep it one-on-one. We're going to keep right. it one-on-one because, frankly, we don't even understand it all. So, so we're going to do one-on-one today. Um, I'll talk quickly, well, as briefly as I can, just the overall anatomy of the bones and the skeleton or the spine. And then we'll go into the soft tissue involved. Um, so I've got just, let's see, I'm going to try and do a share. See if, uh oh, I can't read it. What's it say? It says host disabled. Oh, hang on. Uh, you should be you should be able to share because you should be a co-host. Oop, unmute. Uh oh, make co-host. There we go. I muted you. I have to unmute you. There we go. Okay, say something. Hello. Okay, great. All right, just making sure I unmuted you. You should be able to screen share now. Yep. I'm going to try this again because it didn't want to go to where I wanted it. It's fine. Um, you, sh you should have choices of what uh, thumbnail you want to go to. I did, but I'm looking for my files. Ah. They were on there. Hold on. Here we go. <laughs> there we go. Oh, there's too many windows open. Okay, let's do it this way. How do I find, find my file system? I, I think your files are behind her now. There they are. You may have to 
move that top screen. These guys are working at a distance, so you know that they've added a level of complexity by having that skeleton in front of them between them and the screens. Thank you for that. Yeah. Plus the fact that I'm blind. By the way, you have to appreciate Pam's t-shirt. <laughs> well, I have something to say about that in a minute. Okay. Uh, there we are. All right, you don't see this probably yet, right? Nope. Okay, how do I get now back to? <laughs> it's really complicated. It's very complicated, it is. Yeah, it, sometimes it helps if you make a window smaller so you can see the other windows on the desktop. All right, so I've got that, I've got you. Wait a minute, hold on. I'm doing this on purpose because Diane and I want to get this over with as quickly as we can. Huh? <laughs> okay, let's yeah. try this one you more time. You there you go. Come on. There, awesome. Okay, I don't have much of a presentation, quote unquote, this time because the bones are the presentation yep but we just wanted to do just cover a few little basics right and the first basics is the directional planes the anatomical planes of horses because these words are words that we will use over and over and over again and instead of having to say this is cranial towards the head this is caudal towards the tail we'd like people to get that in their heads and it's pretty uh common sense mm -hmm. cranial for cranium or head uh, caudal is the tail Dorsal is the, is the top of the horse, ventral is anything from the bottom. Uh, we won't be talking about too much about proximal and distal because that's down in the, in the legs, but you're going to hear from us cranium and caudal a lot through this talk. So this is a, obviously a, um, an overview of the skeleton in the horse, and um, you may hear the word axial skeleton. That's the part of the skeleton that's in yellow, so the, the skeleton that's above and the appendicular skeleton are the legs of the horse. So we're going to be focusing on obviously this part through here, which here's the, the neck bones or the cervicals, and then they join in with the thoracics, and you can't see some of them behind the scapula here. The thoracics, the lumbar, sacral, and caudal. So what we're going to be talking about today is the thoracolumbosacral <laughs> region of the horse, primarily. But because many of the muscles uh, that are involved with movement of the horse attach outside of this region, we're also going to be talking, you know, a little bit about um, cervicals and whatnot. So there's this general, what's called the vertebral formula for mammals, and that is Mammals in general have seven cervicals. They have um, roughly, they have 18 thoracic vertebra, but some can have 17. The edge behind us has 19. Um, they all have uh, six lumbar, but others will have five. And sacral vertebra can be anywhere from four to six. So there's variations in the theme, but that's typically what, um, what is referred to with the lumbar formula or the skeletal formula. And I think even pointing out how relatively speaking common it is to not follow that formula from the standpoint of like saddle fitters or people who are thinking that there's only 18 thoracics that we have two in here that have 19. Yeah. And that also includes an extra set of ribs. So um, it, it's, it's interesting that it is not uh, it's not uncommon, I guess, to have the number be different than what we think it should be. Right. Were the two with 19 the same breed? Pardon me? No, one's a quarter horse and one's a Frisian. Oh, wow, you couldn't get more different. You couldn't get more different, absolutely. <laughs> okay, now you want to go back to the full screen for us, Wendy? Yep. Or go live, live to the bones. There we go. So the one, one thing we, we want you to notice is is the length of the spines of the vertebra relative to the bodies. So what you'll see are, you know, the, the spine itself is relatively straight, okay? Yet, this is the contour of the horse, horse's back. And a lot of people don't realize how long these spinous processes are. 
So the regions in the spine are these first ones here are the withers. And you can tell how high they are. It's pretty jumping in. Um, and we come down to where this is 18. So this would be the saddle area, the saddle fitting area. Okay, and then these are the lumbar vertebra and the sacrum. And the difference between the thoracics, one of the difference between the thoracics and the lumbars are the transverse processes that we see. Yeah. Oh, great, good job. Um, can you tell us how many hands this horse was in life? This particular one? Yep. This was a mare, I think she was 16, 16 one. So my point being that this was an average sized horse. Yep. And yet you look at the length of those dorsal processes and they're, they look more than 12 inches to me. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, they're pretty big. Yeah. Uh, it might be worth noting that generally the first um, wither that you can palpate is four, maybe five, a little bit depends on the breed. So there's going to be one, which is the one that Pam just put on. Sorry, here's one. <laughs> one <laughs> short one is. Yeah. And one compared to everybody else. There's one. That's very behind the scapula. So it's something that um, you, you can maybe touch with the back of your hand if you know what you're doing. But generally, it's, it's not something you can palpate, nor is two and three. Yeah, so these are the, probably the, about the first ones that you can feel yeah. right up at the top of the withers. So I'm going to just talk to a little bit about the um, structure of the vertebrae themselves because it's, they're very important. Their morphology is related to how the whole spinal system moves. And as far as movement, we're going to talk first about movement just with the bones and between the bones, and then we'll go into how movement is influenced by the ligaments and the other soft tissue, the muscles and such. And so in general, this is T1, but in general, our vertebra has a body, which is the central area here. Let's, let's do this up closer. We're going to move you closer, guys. Great. Exactly what I was like. I wanted to crawl into my computer. <laughs> right there, there we, go. we need a zoom function, don't we? Mm, but that's okay. That works. Oh yeah, we can read the numbers. Oh yeah, there we go. I just have, have so to. We were talking about you know being behind <laughs> hiding behind. Her this. nickname is Wilson from. <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember that show. Oh okay. oh, quickly the shirt. Okay, if anybody can. <laughs> Sorry. First person to tell us what's wrong with this t-shirt gets one of my myofascial booklets for free. Ah, challenge, guys. Yeah. Uh, Facebook, you too. I don't know how to get you to respond, but I'll look and see the time. Put the time that you commented in, and, and, um, and then I can pick the winner. Okay. It's 120 our time. OK, so, so from 120, whoever gets wrong, And you have to specify what's wrong. And it's not how it fits me. It's what's wrong with the t-shirt. With the, with the image itself. Yes. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Oh, we've got a we've got a response. <laughs> Somebody said that's not a humorous. Hey, no. <laughs> All right. right. It's nice to tell us what it is. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Back back to our vertebra. And I'll just get go for it. Okay. So here's our first thoracic, just to show us the representation. So this lower part in here is the body. Right here. So the cranial, remember cranial part is convex, like a ball, and the caudal part is concave, and that's how the vertebra fit together. Uh, this is where the intervertebral disc is on these ends, which, which is a fibrocartilaginous disc which uh, connects the vertebra together. The, this is where the spinal column is goes through this, this uh, it's called the arch of the vertebra, and extending up from the arch is the spine. This is what you'll be referring to as, as a dorsal spinous process, or DSP. Um, and as you can see, through all of them, they're varying sizes and, and shapes and lengths. The processes here and here are the articular processes. They're, they're joints. Let me get T2. 
put these together while you acquaint. Well, I'm gonna kind of move mine. Okay. So see how they go together? Yep. Okay, you can look down the spinal column at Diane. So these are articulating processes. They are synovial joints between each horse. So there's cranial pair and caudal pair. The cranial pair points up, the caudal pair points down, and they go together like so. So the shape and the size of these and the orientation throughout the spinal column changes. And as it changes, it's supposedly relative, according to experimentation, to the type of motion that is found throughout the spine. Ah, I'm sticking to papers. All right, what am I forgetting? Doing anything? Um, it's probably important to say that uh, in the thoracic spine that there's not a ton of movement between any two vertebrae. It's really the culmination of the total um, movement. You know, there's quite a bit more movement in the cervical spine. Um, so it really is the total amount of movement that's important. And, and the articulations determine the types of movement that are possible, correct? Yes, and the types of movement are? We have flexion and extension. And when we talk about extension, I think uh, is when the back is hollow. I think that's probably the easiest way for people to understand it. So flexion is when they're rounding their back up. That's what we're looking for is for a horse to have its back rounded or over the back. Um, there's also um, lateral or side bending and there's a certain amount of rotation that goes with the side bending. So flexion, extension, uh, side bending and rotation. And those are the same movements that we have in our thoracic spine actually too. Yeah. So, so notice here, this is, this is T17 and 18. And notice the shape and the orientation of the facets here and here. They're angled up a little bit more and they actually interlock more. So what would that do for movement in this area? It would reduce it as far as lateral bending because they, they get more locked in this area. Same thing with the lumbars. And you can see it all the way through the difference, how they change as the angles change throughout the length of the spine. And then of course you've got those very long transverse processes in the lumbar. So any kind of side bending is gonna be inhibited just because that would be touching if you were able to side bend in the lumbar, right? Like, And, and in this case, these ones were in fact uh, overriding here. Um, and he has some fusion as well. Yeah. So when people talk about a horse being on the arc of a circle and they draw a picture like uh, a banana with a curve going all the way through the body, that's really not actually what happens. I think that's an exaggeration of what happens, yeah. There because is, the, that lumbar area really can't form on that side bending curve. No, no. So the lumbar is like you see here. I'll pull the second. Okay, there's, so in this horse there are six. Where you can see it without dropping her. <laughs> yeah, you want to hold that in. And like I said, they're different from the thoracics, which have ribs, in that they have transverse processes, like Wendy said, that come out from the sides. All right. In the last, this is common, in the last two or three, there are joints. And actually, <laughs> she's fused in all of them. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, she looks pretty fused. Yeah, pretty here, fused. This, this should be typically is an open joint, and here and here. And then there's two more down where it, combi it, it um, connects with the sacrum. So in many, this, she was uh, 18 years old. But as we saw with Apollo, he was fused in this area, and he was eight. But this is uh, the way that the spine is stabilizing this area. So the whole lumbar area is meant to stabilize and not move so much. And you can so, see- So when we see fusions in the lumbar area like this horse, 
it, it may or may not be due to some type of damage. It might just be the body stabilizing itself, correct? Yes, these, uh, the joints form here soon after birth. Oops, sorry, <laughs> I'm touching my Wacom and it's going crazy. Um, so the joints are there after birth. It's a matter of how long it takes them to fuse. And that's probably a factor of what's going on in the horse's body as far as stress goes. But they are there to provide stability for this part of the spine. Now in this particular horse, notice the articular processes here. They are interlocking, which they should be, but these have started to ankylose, which means more bone has formed. I'm not sure if you can see it very well. Around the facet joints, you can see it from the top. See that okay? Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Okay. So that if I wanna pull these apart, I have to <laughs> drop one down and pull it off. I can't pull them apart with the tube in there, but these won't come apart, they're totally fused. So that definitely, the spine definitely would not be moving very much. Then the facets, facets are the faces of these, what are you doing? I'm throwing things. Boo, boo, I forgot, is fused everywhere. All right, boo, here you go. People who have, for your first visit here to our bone boom room, you soon find that we start throwing bones all over all the place. place. Okay. <laughs> you know, of course, our question would be is if you were out looking at a bunch of skeletons of wild horses or unridden horses, how, how common would this kind of uh, fusion be? It, is it just the result of riding or driving or, you know, working horses and whatever their job is? Or, or like the case of Apollo, who was, who was born, born with an asymmetry, whether he was ridden or not, or ridden hard or trained hard his life started out as an asymmetrical problem and his spine had to do what it could to sp stabilize itself. So yeah, um, I think it's a matter of degrees and like human bodies, I mean, mine probably looks like this. <laughs> you know, <I> mean, <laughs> it's called life, but for horses to be doing things that we're asking them to do that they may not be able to do. Now in this case, this, this mare, she is, her L3 through six are fused up here. But what I wanted to show you was the oh, articulating yeah. processes of the last lumbar and the sacrum are different shapes than anywhere through the spine. They kind of point up. You have to tell me if you can't see it. Yep, no, we can see that, that's great. Okay, and so what is this, how does this help with movement then? Right, so this is the lumbosacral junction, and it has the most dorsal flex, dorsal ventral flexion throughout the body in the horse. Another uh, factor that uh, helps it have that much dorsal dorsal ventral flexion. I can't talk today. You want to point out the divergence? Or the, uh, right, the direction that the dorsal spinous processes uh, are going that when you get to the last lumbar, um, that it is planking quite cranial and the first sacral, sacral is planking quite caudal. So it leaves this space that allows for that uh, dorsal ventral flexion to happen. Right. Uh, and that's something else that we found is not always typically at the lumbosacral junction, that it can in fact be at a lumbar, lumbo lumbo junction. Oh. Uh, yeah, and we've got an example of that that really kind of opened our eyes. Uh, because he flexes in both places, the lumbosacral and the lumbo lumbo. And, um, <laughs> lumbo, lumbo, lumbo. Uh, and so when someone does a pelvic tuck on their horse and they just come down the, the reflex dines over the sit bones, this is where we're seeing that movement when they tuck their pelvis. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And so if it flexes in two places, is that too mobile? You know, is that horse having a hard time stabilizing himself? In the case of uh, this horse, this is Mikey. Uh, he did. Oh, wow. Oh, so hold the sacrum. So here's his sacrum. Here's his last lumbar. So this should be the lumbosacral joint, but this is his next to the last lumbar. <laughs> and see the space. And that's where the divergence is. Yes, so and you can even see that the, the um, dorsal process has changed shape from, a, from the other horse. It's already angling back. They yeah, like a sacral. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so he, uh, yeah, he's very interesting. What he's was got, he? 
thoroughbred, twelve-year-old event horse. Wow. Yeah, he's, he's another one of our great stories that we we actually he's he's the only uh, the second third horse that we dug up <laughs> from clay. Um, from May. Well, right, you showed us pictures of digging him out of clay. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. Anyways, but he um, since we got Apollo and saw what was going on with Apollo and the genetic malformations that Apollo had, we started looking closer at Mikey again, and he's got very similar. He has a little bit of the C6, C7 malformation, or C6 malformation, not drastic, but modified, and it's, it's all in kind of the story that we're doing, so. Wow, yeah. very cool. Okay, so moving on. So what did I forget? Uh, you ready to do ligaments? Let me just... So, well, can I point out something that you unconsciously did and you didn't even know you did? Yes, people do that, of course. <laughs> Well, because it's one of the things that I find so fascinating about the, the spine is the sacrum is really, it's a lot of fused vertebrae. So it's a very solid structure. And the lumbar area, again, is a very solid structure. But you straightened the dorsal processes on T3, 4, and 5. Mm -hmm. And that's because they moved. And they moved in a different way than the lumbar and the sacral. Like they started to do rotation. Well, they wouldn't so much if the ribs were on them. <laughs> we, we have them balanced on a PVC rack. So um, if they had the ribs on them, they wouldn't, well, the whole thing would be rotated. But, but there's they, more availability of that direction of movement. than like, yeah. basically, if you take the sacrum and the lumbar away, and we're just looking at the thoracic spine, that you can see from the tall dorsal processes to T18, that we have varying changes in the facets, especially the, the dorsal facets, in terms of how much surface area we have, mm -hmm. right? And, yeah. and that angle is changing as we go through, and so it's dictating that there's a different type of movement that's available. Whether or not we can do it, the fact is it's available in some way. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, so many horses, and this is one of the things I really wanted to talk to you about, so many horses rotate their rib cage, and some people actually think that rib cage rotation is side bending, um, but that's a different direction of movement. And so I, I wondered if you could just talk a little bit about the difference between side bending and rotation. I set you up. See, I was actually, I had some stuff I wanted to talk about. <laughs> Right. Well, and because I'm studying osteopathy, I, I may look at it different than other people will, but um, when a horse is, um, <laughs> um, yeah, side, see, so when, when a horse is side bending, if his spine is either in flexion or extension, the rotation will be opposite. And we look at the rotation in the direction that this ventral portion of the spine is going. So if we're side bending to the right, the rotation will be to the left. Does that make sense? Uh, well, we have to think about the screen being reversed. Let's see, if we're side bending oh, right, yeah. it's towards you. Yeah, so we're, we'll just say we're side bending one direction, uh, the vertebra are going to rotate a slight amount in the opposite direction. The body looking oh, at the, the bottom, bottom, the bottom. I'm looking at the top and that's why I'm getting confused. Sorry. I, it's, it, is, it is confusing. That's the what whole, I used to think until I met her. <laughs> <laughs> the whole subject and, and, you know, like we said in the beginning that to demonstrate you would never get this much side bending or this much rotation. It, it's pretty minuscule, especially with, within each, individual vertebra it's more the sum of the total uh, right that you're able to get that movement so because the ribs are attached um in these uh these spots here if if the vertebra is rotating that direction the whole rib cage is also going to rotate which basically gets it out of the way so you can do the side bending right but I, you know i've seen where um how do i put this um uh, ultimately, we always talk about the withers wanting to be vertical when we're side bending um, so that we don't load one front leg more than the other. And the other thing is that the, the amount of bend that we see at the, at the um, 
extension of the radius from the center of the arc to the outside of the ribs, basically where the rider's leg is. The minute you add a radius, the, you know, it's like taking a pencil and turning it a little bit. It's a little tiny, tiny movement at the spine, but it expresses with a rather large movement at the end of the radius. And the longer the radius, the more exaggerated what it appears to be versus what's really happening back at the spinal level. Yeah, <laughs> that, that makes sense. I mean, as you get farther away, uh, you exaggerate that movement. Uh, so, so the bottom line being that um, the amount of movement you're talking about in terms of the, the rotational movement associated with side bend is small. It's small. Right. And it's, it's and, you know, because I've had, I've had a discussion with people many times that they confuse side bending with rotation. And um, well, they're two totally different movements, but they do go together. Correct. But when we have a horse that's like what I, and I guess the reason I'm driving at this is like when I see a horse on a sure foot pad, sometimes I'll see that the chest is completely unlevel when I put it under one front foot and I put it on the other front foot and the chest is totally level, right? And so there's something different going on in terms of what's happening in the thoracic spine when they're on the one foot versus the other. And of course, that's going to involve the thoracic sling. Right. So in my opinion, when they when they stand on a sure foot pad and I don't see this huge uh, angle of the sternum, they're engaging the thoracic sling and stabilizing all of that. But when they're on the other side where I see like I look at the sternum and I'll see it's like angled like and it'll be, you know, 30, 40 degrees. So clearly something's happening in the thoracic spine or not happening in the thoracic sling that's allowing that rib cage to rotate instead of being supported and staying upright. Does that make sense? Right, well, I guess so I would look at it in terms of there maybe being a lot of tension in the thoracic sling muscles on the side that the sternum's pulled to that's sort of holding uh, it in that direction. Uh, and, and so because the, the first eight ribs are attached to the sternum and to the first eight thoracics, that that will affect uh, those thoracics probably more than the false ribs would. Um, but I think you're right that there's something that's happening in the thoracic sling muscles as well as the thoracic bones. Right. And, and um the the fact that you know we have these dorsal processes which are really tall and we have these ribs coming off which are really long um if the movement isn't limited it could cause a lot of problems right like if the movement between them isn't limited if our multifidus isn't doing its job well right and so that's sort of a nice lead into ligaments wendy <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'll get you back, so don't worry. I go off on little trails, but it always comes back. Uh, well, and so, you know, there's this happy medium of that we need the mobility that it has because mobility is everything, but we can't be hypermobile. And so our uh, little ligaments are what's going to keep that from happening. Um, and so just to, uh, to say that ligaments attach bone to bone, uh, tendons attach muscle to bone. So we're going to talk about ligaments in the spine today. Um, the longer ligaments uh, provide stability, which is what we were just talking about. And I think Pam is, what are you going to bring up here? Oh, great. Oh, this is beautiful. Yeah, so, so, so stole this from Kevin Halsler's paper. <laughs> we're giving him credit. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so the very uh, top part of that next to the, the bright blue is the supraspinous ligament. And the supraspinous ligament is a caudal extension of nuchal ligament, which probably most people have heard of. The nuchal ligament comes out of the back of the head of the occiput and um, travels just underneath the crest of the horse's neck. And it will join up with the supraspinous ligament over the withers. And over the withers, it kind of creates this broad band of ligaments as an attachment. Um, and it goes all the way to the last lumbar vertebra. 
So that is a major stabilizing force for your entire thoracics and lumbars is the supraspinous ligament. And that's an important point that it, it ends at the last lumbar. So there's that space between the lumbar and first sacral, the lumbosacral space, in addition to having divergent spines and facets that allow for the dorsal ventral movement, having the supraspinous ligament missing also helps with more dorsal ventral movement in that area. And, and I assume that fa fascia is in here too, right? What's fat? Fascia. <laughs> fa fascia is everywhere. I, mean, I know, I just wanted to bring that in. <laughs> I mean, there's fascia in the ligaments and there's fascia in the bones and there's fascia in the muscles and it's all interwoven together. Um, so I'm becoming more and more fascinated with fascia. And yes, I did mean a pun. <laughs> Well, you know, the last one, the last webinar we did, we cut it short before we could talk about fascia. Oh, well, that just means we have to do another one. <laughs> so there's two other longitudinal ligaments beside the supraspinous. Um, you can't see them on this, though. Or the ventral, right? The, the, uh, yeah, so there's the ventral longitudinal lig ligament that goes on the very bottom, the ventral surface of the vertebral bodies. Um, and that basically, if the horse's back is really in extension, that ligament's gonna be straining up because the, those ventral bodies are pushing down on it. And there's a dorsal uh, horizontal ligament, long, sorry, longitudinal ligament. Um, that runs through the spinal column. Yeah, so okay, that would be this one right there. That one you Maybe. can't really see. Yeah. Um, Is that commonly strained in gated horses that are going in what's called ventroflexion? I would, I would think so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Everything's strained in that. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so those are your big longitudinal ligaments. Then we have shorter ligaments in the spine that connect the individual vertebra. Um, so those ones where Pam's cursor is are the interspinal ligaments. And we can come back and look at the um, spine in front of us and see what happens when there's a lot of strain on the intra spinous ligaments. Um, there's intertransverse ligaments, and those are in the lumbar in between those long transverse processes. Um, and there's a ligament flavum, which is it, basically all those short ones are just uh, support and stability for the, uh, the whole spinal column. It's another, uh, just a little point to make about, about the inner spinous and supraspinous ligaments is they're highly innervated. Um, not only with, with, with both pain nerves, no, no susceptors, and proprioceptors. So we have a pet peeve about the surgery that they like to do with to cut through the ligaments. Cut through the ligaments for kissing spine because of all the nerves that are being damaged there when they do that. But that's another wormhole, all right? <laughs> well, wouldn't that be similar to what do they do in people when they have back pain? They do a, a what's it called? I can't remember, but there's a type of surgery that they cut part of the bones out and things, and I would think it'd be similar. Mm -hmm. I think that always seems bad. Um, so, so when we're looking at bones, then we're we're it's kind of a false setting because we don't see these ligaments that are connecting all of it, and so like looking at the possible movement of the bones is not the same as looking at the movement with the ligaments and fascia and not even really the muscles at this point just the ligaments and fascia are going to stabilize this system quite a bit well they are and, and the other thing is that all of those ligaments we just talked about um, the longitudinal ones as well as the smaller ones that sort of cross in between the bones they're all connected uh from the top ventral uh with fascia it's like it, they're not just this separate one here and a separate one here it's like they all are intertwined and connected. So that helps to lend this, this stability and also that little cliche thing that it's all connected is so true. That you, it's hard to affect one thing without affecting multiple others. Um, so that's kind of ligaments. We can move on to muscle. Can we move the bones that are in front of T10987 uh, so that we can see the side of the spine a little better? L2. 
Oh, oh, one. Oh, yeah, we sort we sort of sort fell apart our, here, didn't we? No, we just pulled apart. We don't need. Because, them. I mean, it's and, and I'm, I, here's a leading question: What are all those holes on the sides of the vertebrae? And you read my mind. Yeah, <laughs> I was just gonna start. I was just gonna say, oh, I forgot to mention. Yes. So where the vertebra come together? Let me see if I can see where is a good one. So you're talking about our little holes right here, right? right there. Yes, that's it. Yep, little black, it looks like little black dots, like somebody painted black dots because we're only seeing a flat screen picture. Take it closer. Let's <laughs> push this hole. Oh, careful. Last time we did that, it all fell apart. All right. Oh, tip that. There we go. Okay. Those are your form, your foramen. Yep. These are called inter vertebral, so in between the vertebra, foramen. And a foramina or for a foramen is a hole or a canal. So the spinal column passes through the vertebral body, and through these areas come the peripheral nerves that come out and go down through to the various parts of the body. They're supposed to. Where's a normal one? <laughs> oh, okay. That was that's a leading statement. <laughs> a live horse, apparently. Uh, not that I've seen it myself, but I was instructed. This is an open area, but right about here, there's a very, very small ligament closing it off. And my analogy is with a peacock stirrup. Mm-hmm. All right, so a peacock stirrup that children might use that has that rubber band that goes, um, closes off the stirrup. Right, like a safety so, stirrup you're talking about. Exactly, yeah. Well, in many cases, os this ossifies and turns to bone. And that's what you're seeing here on these ones that are actually closed. So it's really not supposed to look like a little circle. Not no, no. And I've been told by veterinarians that even if it looks like this, it probably isn't causing any problems. But you get looking like this with a spur on it. Oh, wow. Um, and I'll just say, in a personal note, my back looks like this. <laughs> or it did. And that caused a lot of problems for me back in my 20s. And I had to have surgery to remove the disc. But also, they had to carve this bone open to make more room. So, so if we look back at T16, 15, 14, where it's more like a little line. Yeah, it's just open. It's a poor open area. And that's what it what the ones up there at T10, 9, 8 yeah. are supposed to look like, but they just look like little caves, little cave entrances. And yeah, they're just yeah, that's what a foramen is, is a is an entrance way that the, the nerves go through. But in many cases there they have well, my other comment is those holes are huge. So the size of the nerve coming out of that hole, it's, it looks like it's almost the size of my pinky finger. Well, it's a combination of nerves, right? Well, yeah, well, it's the, there's a dorsal and a ventral root that come out and then they branch off and go to all of the various areas in the body. Um, but yeah, there, it's a good size, good size hole for a good size nerve. And when you see that hole, start to close off into a hole instead of more of an opening, then you have to wonder if there isn't some impingement happening there, let alone with a spur that might be painful, um, just that the hole might be a little bit smaller than it should be. One other thing I'll point out a pathology, because we were talking about the interspinous ligament. So the ligament that runs, goes between the spines. Notice these jaggedy okay. edges here. Oh, okay. oh yeah, you can see it clearly on T4 and um, T5 for sure. When we're putting these together, we're actually getting cut by, the, these are called enthesophytes. So an enthesis is the place on the bone where, lig where soft tissue ligament, uh, tendon, fascia, or muscle attach right to the bone. Yep. In this case, uh, probably what has happened is um, the interspinous ligament for whatever stress reason, pulled, and more bone was pulled out and formed from it. So this is not. So the first time I ever heard the word anthesis was last night with Dr. Butler. Oh, and now I get to see one. <laughs> yeah, they're everywhere. What was she talking about anthesis um, being? 
it was just part, it was just a line on one of her slides and she said we have taught, you know, that would be for another lecture. Um, and so this is fabulous to actually see an, an uh, is it anthesis, plural, antheses? Yeah, there, there are various parts of the body, Apollo had a lot of them. So it's a place where the ligament has been stretched and the bone it start to calcify. Yes, that's one. That's one uh, explanation. But others will say that it's this area um, at the attachment site became inflamed, and so that the in this case the ligament that was attached here became inflamed, and then that would cause you know would turn to ossification and bone. There's so we can almost think of it as like a tiny little bone spur. It is a bone it is spur. A little bone spur. Yeah. yeah, that's what a bone spur is. Is an adhesive bite. Yeah. And since that those ligaments are highly innervated. Mm. Oops. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Mm. You know, so often we just blame horses for being badly behaved, and and there's no bad horses. There's no just such things. Things, things that are painful. Yeah. They're just yep. And they only have so many ways of telling us that something isn't right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, and I think actually they have a lot, um, they have plenty of ways to tell us, we just have to listen. Yes, um, somebody's asking how you spell anthesis. E-N-T-H-E-S-I-S. -S. Thank you. Yeah, if you Google it, uh, there's some great papers out there for human or just bones about how they form. Um, they're also considered to be areas uh, in the body that have been stressed on the bones. So they will, if they're looking, going back and looking at uh, paleo fossils uh, of mammals and they're trying to determine what kind of lifestyle they led, they will look for anthesophytes in certain places. Um, a big one is up where the nuchal ligament attaches the back of the skull. Mm. That will really be a big, we've got several examples here on all of our skulls who are not COVID compliant this week. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and they actually like to um, draw conclusions or, you know, they try to surmise that the horse had some kind of heavy duty job in their lives because of the anthesophyte formation. Oh, wow. So say if it was a driving horse that had an overcheck. Would that possibly. A, a possible cause? So um, let me ask you this question. It's kind of like rhetorical but a bit, but I mean, there's no way we can get through life and not have some signs of something happening. Mm -hmm. You know, even if we're a horse in the wild or a person that's been mothballed, that just life itself is going to have some wear and tear on our bodies. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And so it's really more of a question of how severe and where. Like right. you could have certain things happening in some locations, like in the in the lumbar spine where we see that fusion and the transverse processes, and maybe that's just the body trying to stabilize itself and so reinforce with more bone. And so that's not gonna necessarily cause a lot of problems. But if we get kissing spine, for instance that would be something painful being ridden because you have the weight coming down on the back. Well, I think also possibly that while certain amounts of pathology are happening, like the fusion in the lumbar, it might be more uncomfortable during that process of fusing. But once the fusion takes place, you know, you've lost that mobility, but there's not bone rubbing on bone. It's now stabilized. And you know, possibly it becomes less painful. It's like when they talk about riding a horse whose hocks are fusing to keep riding them until they fuse. Uh, I, I'm not sure how I feel about that, but there there is some um, truth to the fact that once things fuse, they're potentially less painful. Right. So go ahead, Pam. I'm just. <laughs> I think a difference, at least for me personally, is like I say, I had a, I had a lot of those back issues and. I can complain when they hurt and I can go see a doctor if it gets so bad that I can't stand it. But what's the horse saying? And are we, again, are we listening to what, do we understand when it gets to a point? Cause they won't say very much until it's really at an extreme point. Right. Yeah, so, and, and this spine here, I, I don't see that there's any kissing spine going on in this particular spine. Is that correct? So. No, she's not impinging. She wasn't. No. 
But can you kind of take a couple vertebrae and demonstrate what happens in kissing spine, just briefly? Well, let's get Apollo. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Pretty much all these guys here are. All right, what about Edge? So it's um, kind of nice to see a spine that's not kissing. Um, yeah. Edge actually has some kissing spine. If, oh, you got to tip your. Yeah, we'll have to rearrange the camera. Uh, also, we we're going to do a little tour of Edge and the rib attachments, and I was going to move the. Okay. Lap. Do that. Are we ready to do that? We can do that. We can talk about the. Uh, you want to talk about ribs real quick? Yeah. Well, um, kind of unplug a few things here. This we have we have a, a loose rib here. We'll kind of look at edges ribs when we get closer to him, uh, just so people can see. Um, this is a sixth rib, so it's towards the beginning of the thoracic spine, and you can see how wide they are. Um, I. I I didn't realize how, how big and wide they were. Um, that's Petey's. Oh, wow. Yeah. It's like a sword. It's like a boomerang. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if that's where boomerangs came from, actually. And, and it's interesting because the, the uh, uh, yeah, I just lost my words, the part that goes into the vertebrae, yeah. it, it's so round. Well, there's actually two different uh, articular faces here. Um, that articulate with two different vertebrae, oh. and then there's a third articulation. So we were number six. Number six. We were talking earlier, or I was, about the fact that there's 180 articulations uh, in the thoracic spine between the spine itself, the vertebrae themselves, and all of the, these three uh, articulations with each rib, except for the last rib. Only has we have to pick the one rib that does labels or on boo. I'm gonna have to up my count for people I've always talked about that there's 36 joints in the first six ribs but maybe there's more. Maybe I'm, I'm under counting. <laughs> well, there's three for every rib. Three at, the, at the um, vertebral body not including the sternal connection right? Yes at the vertebral body exactly. Oh then I'm gonna have to up my count a lot. <laughs> All right so I, can you see on boo here six and seven? Or six yes. and five, because the rib that Diane has is number six. So part of it would attach here, and then the other pet, so they, it spans both vertebrae. Oh, right. And so the little, the uh, costochondral and the, and what is the other one? <laughs> <laughs> the other little ligaments that attach these ribs to the vertebra are also part of the stabilization yeah. process of the spinal column because they are quite strongly attached. So, you know, most people think about all these joints as being uh, for mobility, but the more I listen to you in terms of the ligaments and the fascia, it looks like the body's trying to stabilize things. It's stable mobility. I mean, it definitely has to have mobility, but there also has to be, especially when you think about us sitting on top of all this, because that's what our, our saddles aren't actually sitting on the spine. They're sitting on the tops of the ribs. Right. We'll show you. <laughs> yeah. Let's go. Ready for a ride, I'll try and go smoothly. If I, I'm going to be carrying. Okay. You guys are heavy. So I'll just talk briefly about a little bit of uh, nomenclature that the uh, epaxial muscles are muscles that are um, above the vertebral column and the hypaxial are below. So the epaxial muscles of the uh, vertebral, the thoracic and lumbar spine, um, we can start with these little uh, multifity muscles. And I put some colored clay on to make uh, a little bit of a demonstration of how they are multi-layered and that they cover from one uh, vertebral joint to four. And they just move along the whole, um, spine stabilizing. They've got a lot of proprioceptors in them too. And so they are the, the deepest um, of our musculature. Um, Multifidus is my favorite actually. <laughs> I like to say it. <laughs> no. And it's so, it's so beautifully designed in its rope-like structure and the interconnections. It's just and it's an amazing structure. <laughs> They're pretty amazing. I actually sort of got a better feeling for how they function just by uh, doing this webinar, you know, looking a little deeper into it. Um, so 
then those are sort of the short muscles that are involved with the back. The longer muscle and the longest muscle, the biggest and longest muscle in the body is the longissimus dorsi. Oh, and we have a, a picture of that. Yeah, we'll put it up. We'll put later. that up a little bit later. Um, that sort of lays across the top. Um, it, it connects to the cervical vertebra and it also connects back here. Um, well, it ends up connecting to the gluteal muscle. Um, it's a very strong, very important muscle. It gives the form to the back. So when people are looking for their horse to have a top line, they're really looking at the development of the longissimus muscle. Um, and next to the longissimus muscle, sort of running in parallel to it is the iliocostalis. Uh, those are major back stabilizers. And uh, because the longissimus has a tongue that goes into the, medial, the middle gluteal muscle, then we end up having the ability to flex the lumbar somewhat with the longissimus and the gluteal muscle. Um, what am I missing on that? That blue ribbon is spike is oh, the yeah. spinous. That's the supraspinous ligament. <laughs> do something with that blue And ribbon. the nuchal ligament ties into the supraspinous, correct? It does. Yes. Yeah. At the withers. Yeah. At the withers. Right. And, and so, so we don't since we don't have a neck on this horse right now that we wouldn't see that nuchal ligament tying in. Guess it's not there. We're working on it. We're, We're working, working on it. It's awesome. <laughs> but this is really, it's really neat to see, you know, having seen the spine by itself, but now seeing it how you're how it's connecting to the ribs and I and the ribs themselves just the way they're uh, um attaching into the vertebral bodies is it's beautiful actually the design is so amazing you move it around so you can see kind of the shelf what diane said where the saddle actually yeah, rests actually be sitting is that showing it here yeah actually. yeah actually diane if you just set your hand right on the top of the ribs where the panel of the saddle would need to sit right well, and I have a saddle pad sitting here we were gonna sort of show, um, but yeah, you can kind of get an appreciation for that this is a nice flat area for the saddle to sit on. Um, and so how deep is the muscle between the ribs and where the saddle's actually physically touching the horse? How, how deep is that, roughly? Uh, this is probably four inches. Yeah, so that's a lot of depth. It's a lot of depth of muscle, absolutely. And that's the other muscle I was gonna talk about is the spinalis, this little triangular shaped muscle that's right at the base of the withers. And it's a muscle that can become really angry and inflamed with poor saddle fed if you have a way too tight uh, of a, um, the head plate in your saddle, that spinalis is, is gonna be affected as will the latissimus dorsi muscle. Um, so when we put our hands on a horse's withers and we see the like the top of the shoulder blade, well, you know, you're you're really only maybe touching the first inch of the dorsal process and the shoulder blades covering up a lot of it. And here, hang on. Oh. Unfortunately, the leg that we have articulated is the other side. Well, that's okay. <laughs> it edges other scapula. <laughs> um, and so it's gonna sit, well, it's gonna be up here covering T1 mostly. Yeah. About like this. And don't forget the cartilage at the top. Right, the cartilage cap. Yeah, so there's probably cartilage that's gonna come here. So you want your saddle to be sitting behind this cartilage. And then when the leg moves forward, it comes back. Right. right. Yeah, so this is gonna move in this sort of direction. And I have, just as a visual. Don't fall over. Try not to knock edge over. Yeah, that would be a, down that edge. Would be a tra travesty. That, that would, uh, yeah. <laughs> Is that too high on the wither so? Of course, we didn't fit them to this pad. We just pulled it out <laughs> of one of my pads. Yeah, but this is great because now you get to see just exactly what, um, you know, where are the bones versus where are the muscles? And this is great. Keep going. I'm loving it. Yeah. So uh, basically your saddle fit area is from behind the scapular cartilage until this last rib. And behind the rib are these transverse processes of the lumbar and they are unsupported. So- uh, Notice the last rib too. I'm trying to do this without making y'all seasick. 
it really how it angles. extangles angles behind underneath the lumbars. Wow. And then the sternum only attaches uh, direct. How many ribs attach directly to the sternum? First eight. And then the rest have a common cartilage that swings into That's the sternum. Right, kind of the costal arch here. Yeah, goes all along the bottom. Yeah, like that. So okay. they're somewhat more flexible and they have a little bit different motion in the way that they move. Um, they also look like they have a very different shape. Well, they're more rounded instead of this sort of flat wide rib that is in the front. Take the pad off, we'll show an articulation. You're gonna get Diane talking about diaphragm in a minute. Oh boy. Well, that's where I was kind of thinking, you know, yeah. there's gotta be something filling that space. <laughs> I'm trying to get this up so you can see the complicated articulations of the ribs that we. Yeah. <laughs> glued and wired. Glued and wired. They did not really want to stay in here that well because we're missing all the soft tissue. So it's hard to have it fit together the way it would in a live body. We need somebody to come up with uh, some kind of material that simulates the fascia and ligaments and tendons so that we can put these together in a flexible form. Wouldn't that be something? <laughs> I'll have to work on that, okay? Good, we're working on it. So in, in talking about the muscles covering these uh, long back muscles, the little, little tiffity, then the other muscles that start to play an important part uh, in, the, in the rib cage and the thoracic spine would be your intercostal muscles. Uh, um, there's ex external intercostals that angle um, from co caudal ventral and then the internals uh, angle from cranial ventral so they kind of crisscross each other and they are an important part of uh, the breathing of a horse that those muscles have to be flexible so that the horse can fill his lungs uh, and empty his lungs, um, and they're of course stabilize the whole rib cage. Um, what else have we got? I, I often tell people if they like eating ribs, that they're eating the intercostal muscles. They'll yeah. either keep yeah. eating ribs or they'll stop. I think, I think you just ruined ribs for me. I'm oh, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> you just have to separate anatomy from food. Okay. Yeah. yeah no kidding. Well, isn't the psoas nature the tenderloin? Yeah. Oh, is it? Yeah. yeah. Why don't you show the kissing spines take off? Oh, yeah, yeah. That's where, why we kind of came over here. Here, we'll get rid of this. Okay. So let's see. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. And 16 is typically what they call the anticlinal uh, vertebra in that it tends to be more straight up and down. Uh, instead of angle cranial or caudally. Yeah, but him, it's but 17. because he has 19, uh, it's actually the 17th. The 17th would be oh, example. wild. Um, I I think. Don't quote me on this, but I think that this is a little farther back than a lot of kissing spine are. I feel like a lot of kissing spine are more right under where the person, the middle of the saddle, and this would be back towards the back of the saddle. Um, well, you have to wonder having 19 ribs if that's not somehow changing a bit of the dynamics of the back underweight. Absolutely. And his owner said to me when I told her that he had 19 uh, vertebra, thoracic vertebra and 19 ribs, she said that she'd always told people that he was built like a dachshund with short legs and a long back. Oh, how interesting. Well, his back is also uh, spondylost and one place or two places? So define spondylost for me, please. Okay, spondyl, spondyl refers to the body of the vertebra. It's right there. Uh, I'd have to crawl under I to know, see it. Gets, it's too bad we can't really get the computer under there to show it. I could show it on another one. But uh, essentially the, the bodies, keep it simple, the vertebral bodies have uh, fused. Oh, okay. <laughs> Because I've heard the word spondylosis in people, and, and I've never understood it. I, it's uh, I it's just sick a different at. kind of fusion. Uh, okay, so it's the ventral surface of the, of the bodies. Right. Um, I could show it to you on another one, but I have to crawl over there. You want me, I'll hold this. <laughs> you guys are doing awesome. <laughs> oh, <laughs> you go over. I thought you were bringing the bone to us. I can't bring the bones to you. All oh, right. 
The, these guys, I, I pulled them into doing this webinar at the last minute and they're doing such a fabulous job. I, I just want exactly. you all to know. <laughs> Wendy, can you see these two? Oh yeah. Those are spondylo spondylosed vertebra. And the little edges coming off, those that's ankylosing. So that's where the ligaments in that area are starting, we're starting to ossify. And eventually if the source had lived longer, those would be spondylosing. Ankylosing, ankylosing spondylosis. Wow. So that's okay. pathology. Watch out for. Yeah. <laughs> All right, we're gonna. Take we back. have a question here, and while you're coming back to your table, I'm just gonna ask you this question. Um, it's about anthesis. Is there any thought to remodeling changes like this being related to stress or pulling of the periosteum from the outside of the bone, which causes fibrous tissue or ossification to lay down between the periosteum and the bone, question mark. I could be totally wrong, just reminds me of the way the toe comes forward in migration. And I, that was, the, it was some, a similar thought I had, is when we see this slipper toe that Bob Belker talks about on the coffin bone, where the periosteum is getting stretched and then you're getting bone changes. Um, I'm, laughing. I'm laughing, Wendy, because whoever wrote that just took it out of the textbook, yes. <laughs> Okay, so the answer is yes. It's basically this: the we're going to have stretching of the periosteum and then the calcification forming, and yes. that's basically an anthesis. That was Emily. Thanks, Emily. That was a great question. Um, <laughs> and then I had. Let's see what I had over here. Oh, people are loving this, by the way. I up on Facebook. I'm actually able to see the there's comments. A lot of people are watching, and you know it's. It's really such a pleasure to have you guys come on. And I know how much work this is to set it up because you know, your bone room is set up in one way and you have to totally reorganize it for the cameras. Um, and you know- um, You don't want to see what's on the camera. But it's just, you know, I mean, what I'm finding with these webinars is people are so hungry for real information, you know, real scientific, provable factual data and to help them understand their horses because you know i can remember so many trainers that would just say well just beat the horse up or just tell him to quit it or whatever and we've we've been taught from very early on to deny the horse's experience to deny the the um the the horse's only way of telling us that there's a problem which is by bad behavior because he hurts and um, and what you're showing us is that no horse is going to do anything just because, just because. There's always a reason. And it's our job to start listening more to sort out, maybe we won't ever find out until like here, until they're, that we're looking at their bones. But we have to be more willing to listen. And that doesn't mean coddle or... Um, let them run our lives. You know, it's like a kid. Just because the kid complains doesn't mean we're always going to pl placate them and, and bow to their will, but it does mean we have to be intelligent enough to stop and say, what are they trying to tell us? Absolutely. What What is the, the meaning behind the behavior? And how can we start to um, tease it apart to figure out, is this something that we need to address and if so how you know and that's i think just so important in terms of making sure we get the right help but we first have to recognize that they're trying to tell us something right. absolutely right. Yeah. and i think it's so frustrating that certainly uh, some of the people that we've talked to and, and gotten bones from that they have gone to the ends of the earth with diagnostics and really trying to figure out things and uh, it's been such a learning experience to find out that there's a lot of these things that you just you can't see it, they aren't necessarily diagnosable but knowing that if you can't make the horse more comfortable then um you have to maybe change your expectations like maybe the horse is still perfectly rideable still a perfectly nice horse for a variety of things but maybe not as an upper level sport horse you right. know just because you can't make a definitive diagnosis doesn't mean that there's nothing wrong or that the horse is done. It just means that he needs to maybe have a different job. Right. Uh, so there's a lot of different ways to look at it, but that's certainly been a learning experience for me that what I thought I had with the horse, that it's a perfectly good horse. I just can't do all of the things I thought maybe I would. Mm -hmm. And that's fine. That's perfectly fine. Yeah, and, and sort of in addition to that, 
is it, if we really want to do a certain activity and the horse isn't able to do that, it's okay to find a good home for him where that horse is going to excel in, his, in the job that he can do. And I, you know, this takes me back to the Feldenkrais method where uh, Dr. Feldenkrais would always talk about our ability to achieve our potential. And, uh, you know, yeah, that's what we're looking for in the horses is to help them achieve the potential that they can achieve and then recognize when our desires and their abilities may not be on the same path, but then do right by the horse and honor that and find someone who's going to appreciate that horse for the job he does do. And there are so many horses that um, have such a purpose in life, but it wasn't the original purpose, right? I, I think of a lot of therapy horses and, uh, and um, horses for children and pony club and then if we really have that desire that we want to do, say, top level competition, that we not only look for the horse that's capable of doing the job, but support that horse so that we don't wind up here looking at its skeleton. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And that includes everything from nutrition and saddle fit and feet, body work, and yeah, feet, feet. <laughs> it goes on and on. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Well, I'm working on rounding out um, some of the um, guests that I've had on the webinars, um, I'm still, you know, I, people have been sending me suggestions and I think I could keep going till the end of the year and, and not even lap back too many times. Um, because there's so much knowledge that's, uh, that's out there. It's just, how do we get it to the people that are looking? And, and that's really what these webinars are so about is it's helping people know, A, there's an, there is information. And, and I can remember in my own life, hitting moments with, I had this one horse that, uh, it's a long story, but it was a thoroughbred off the track and you'd put the saddle on him and his eye would turn into a prune and then you didn't know which way he was going to explode. And, you know, I was just out of, you know, um, grads, I was in grad school at the time, actually, and you're a poor grad student and you're a science, you know, um, and there, wa there wasn't a lot of answers. There wasn't really, this is quite a while ago, you know, and so, I was lost. I didn't know how to solve the problem until I had a horse flip on top of me and then I met Linda Tellington Jones. So <laughs> the universe has ways of guiding us to find the information that we need, but I'm hoping people don't have to go through quite such an extreme experience. <laughs> I think there's, I think there's, we're seeing a very slow but forward paradigm shift or else we're just, it's just the world that we're in. We surround ourselves with people who are starting to pay attention to these things with their horses to benefit their horses. There is a paradigm shift, Pam, because I mean, I can go back to riding in the 70s when the gullets on saddles were one finger wide. And the saddles were open cell foam and the tree was sitting directly on, you know, on the withers. So, you know, when you, but we have to look at a longer scale. And mm -hmm. I think that's the thing is you and I, and, and Diane's not quite as old as us. Um, you know, we're looking, looking at like a 50 years, <laughs> and but my point being, you know, as we have a larger scale, we can see the changes that are happening. And if you have a shorter scale, it sometimes feels frustrating, like there aren't changes, but there really have been some pretty major changes that are going on and continuing to go on because now we have the scientific equipment to be able to look at some of these things um, before they get to this stage. Yeah. yeah. Well, our, our, one of our missions, and you mentioned, is, is getting that information where people will pay attention to it is with the veterinarians. Because a lot of what we're seeing here, they haven't seen or they don't have time. You know, it's not on their radar screens. They're doing their thing to figure out their, you know, the lamenesses and whatnot. Um, so we're, you know, we keep trying to put this out there to <laughs> where veterinarians will go, oh, gosh, I hadn't even thought that that might be a problem. Well, and, and I do know for a fact that there's been a fair number of veterinarians watching the webinars, and so you are getting to them. And <laughs> we love them. <laughs> um, yeah, because I, I mean, I, I have people email me and message me, and, and everybody so appreciates the knowledge and information. Like, you've been one of my more popular guests, you two. Um, and I'm sure that this is going to be another popular webinar and it's just, it is getting there. So just keep the faith, have hope. And, um, and we just continue marching forward. And, you know, that's, again, I go back to one of the benefits of the pandemic, which would never have happened if we weren't locked down 
is that we are making these connections and we can use the technology, like you guys figured out how to do these webinars with me, which is so fabulous, so that we can bring the information out to a larger audience. And so I, I really appreciate the effort. I just know how hard you guys have worked to get this set up and it's lovely and it's really educational. And um, there's lots of comments of people really appreciating what you've done for us today. So I thank you from the bottom of my heart because it's really a pleasure to have you on and, um, and to, to come back and do this webinar. Yeah, thank you, Wendy, for being the format for getting all this information out there because it's fantastic. Yeah, we, we much rather be in the bone room articulating bones than doing anything else. So <laughs> it gave us a chance. So I know you're going off to Maine and, you're, and you've got some really interesting things planned. Do you want to give us a little hint of what you're going to be doing up there? Well, hopefully I'll be um, uncovering some more skeletons, horses that were donated that fit our profile of Apollo. Um, so we can get hopefully some more information on how uh, their breeding, their life story, and um, their bones relate. Uh, so that's pretty much, well, also to get away from heat. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's my, that's my uh, job when I go up there. Uh, hopefully, I'm hoping they'll be ready. They may not be, not all of them, but, um, uh, and I hope to contact and get more information from the owners. They've been wonderful to be able to, to go through this very um, emotional, emotional heart-wrenching you know, stories, very similar to Apollo, but hopefully we'll get more information on that. And how long, when do you come back to the bone room, I guess is my question. When do you return? Uh, I, it, well, I'll back in October, it depends. When depends on COVID. I was supposed to go to England in April to do a standing whole horse dissection with Jeremy Davis oh. in April, and that got, yeah, <laughs> squashed. And they've they've reset the time for the end of October, November. So I need to get back here and get settled before I fly to England to do that, if that happens at all. But I will be back in, in October. Okay, yeah. I'm just planning on when I'm going to ask you to be back as a guest again, and uh -huh. it. <laughs> Well, I do something up there. I mean, Diane's going to come visit me in Maine. My problem is internet. I don't have you know, right in Maine, and I really don't have much of a connection there. That's um, that's what I'm afraid of. But yeah, because I I've, I've been to Maine and it's a little remote. Um, that's okay. We can just plan for 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 early winter because yeah, we'll, have, we'll have lots of stories to tell. I'm sure we still have stories here to tell. Right, and yeah. just in case people want to know, where can they get a copy of your book? Oh, you're disappearing oh, in and out. Uh, I know it's because my background. How do you do that? That's <laughs> um, because I have a, there we go. The myofascial uh, kinetic, I'm reading this backwards. Meridians and horses, yep. Yes, uh, you can uh, go to equispashsoma.com and in the navigation bar, there's a store. And that's where you can purchase, uh, purchase them. There's also more information on them. Um, I think there's navigation to the fascial fashion horses so you can read it you can look at them online and read about it and if you want they have the booklet they're use, they're useful especially for body workers yep and finally the last question is what is the bone that's on your shirt i thought we were supposed to have an answer well we did and um i had i have to scroll back because it was a while ago um somebody said it was a cannon bone um someone was wondering if it was a femur and somebody else wondered if it was a radius it's the radius. It's the radius. It's not a horse. <laughs> it's a radius. So we have one person that said it was not the humerus that first. That was uh, Dendra um, McLaughlin. But she didn't get the bone right. She thought it was a cannon bone. And Melody Tooper guessed that it was the radius. Well, I'll tell you what. Tell both of them. Both of them. Uh, um... They can contact you on Facebook? They can contact me with their addresses, their shipping addresses on Facebook, and they can both have one. All right, so Dendria and Melody, just contact Pam on Facebook so that you can get your, your prize of oh. one of these body <laughs> All right, well, thank you, ladies. It's been a pleasure, and um, I just so appreciate you guys. Wait, wait, you have a second? Oh, yeah, yeah. I just want to update you on Princess with a oh. the, the head-shaking horse. Oh, yes. 
Yeah, it's, um, we're getting some repeatable results that she is still, she'll go for like a week or so just fine and then she'll start doing the head shaking and she'll hang out in the morning and I, she usually likes to stand on the pads two days in a row for a good 30, 40 minutes a day and then she stops head shaking. So, wow. it's so, so two days in a row for about 30 minutes a piece and she's good for a little over a week. A week, yep, yep. Isn't that interesting? That's really interesting. So now what we need is a, other people that have horses that have head shakers. And what, what density pattern does she choose different ones different times? She likes the physio. I have a large physio and she likes to stand on it with both front feet. Okay. So if anybody's got a horse with head shaking that's listening to this webinar and you have a large physio pad, the full physio pad, um, it would be really interesting to see A, if your horse likes standing on that pad and B, if it has any effect on the head shaking. Um, since Pam has an N of one right now, we'd like to get some other numbers and see because that's that's a really difficult problem for a lot of horses. Well, what's interesting is when she's not head shaking and I offer her the pad, she walks off it. I put her feet on, she steps right off. She doesn't want to be on it if she's not head shaking. Wow, that's, yes. I, I know they know their body, but that's really fascinating. That's super <laughs> cool. <laughs> she's an opinionated lady. <laughs> Anyways, I just wanted to update you on that. So oh, thanks. I really appreciate it. All right. Well, thanks everybody for tuning in. Just remember you can find this in all the webinars and be sure to go back and watch uh, Diane and Pam's previous webinar. I can't tell you what number it is because I wasn't numbering at the time, but you can search in the webinar listing to see their earlier webinar, which was really fascinating and the story of Apollo. Um, and we'll see you tomorrow. What's today? Wednesday. My guest tomorrow is, I can't remember anymore. Um, I guess tomorrow, wait, I lost it. Uh, oh, Deb Davies. Oh, how could I forget? We have Deb Davies tomorrow. She's going to talk about proprioception. So I'm really excited about that. Yeah. All right. So thanks again and, and take care. Have a great day. Bye. Bye.